The brutal killing of an Australian woman in 1917 led police to suspect that her husband was behind her callous murder. Only as time progressed, it became increasingly apparent that this case was far from that simple. Soon enough, the horrifying truth would unravel and, in turn, reveal a shocking secret. In 1912, a man named Harry Leo Crawford worked as a coachman for a Dr. Clark in Warunga, northern Sydney, Australia, and it was here that he met a woman called Annie Burkett, who soon became his love interest. Annie was in her 30s and worked as Dr. Clark's housekeeper. She had been widowed for several years by this point, but she did have an 11-year-old son by her late husband, Harry Bell Burkett. Annie managed to save up some money and eventually bought a confectionery shop in Balmain in the west of Sydney, where she moved to with her son and her lover, Harry Crawford. The couple eventually married on the 19th of February 1913 in a Methodist church in Balmain. Not long after the couple were wed, they sold the confectionery shop and moved to the wealthier Sydney suburb of Germoyne, with Annie's son and Harry's 16-year-old daughter, Josephine, who up until this point had been living with her grandmother. Harry gained employment in various hotels and factories in the area, but he was a heavy drinker and far from Annie's ideal husband. He was noted as being quite uncouth and was seemingly below Annie's normal standard of male suitor. On the 28th of September 1917, Annie suggested that she and Harry go for a picnic near Lane Cove River. Upon arriving at the river, however, Annie expressed her desire to leave her husband. During their subsequent quarrel, Annie allegedly fell backwards and hit her head on a rock, knocking her out cold. Crawford allegedly tried to save his wife's life, but he could not, and Annie died within a matter of minutes. Harry subsequently went into a frenzy, fearing that he would be investigated, so he attempted to burn Annie's body to prevent her identification. Annie's son, Harry Burkett, returned home later that day after visiting the beach and asked Crawford where his mother was, to which he replied that Annie had gone to stay with friends in northern Sydney after the pair had had a disagreement. He then told Burkett on a separate occasion that Annie had run off with another man. Burkett found Crawford's story to be rather off, and he didn't believe that his mother would have left without saying goodbye. Annie and her son had a very good relationship, so upon his mother's supposed abrupt departure, something didn't sit right with 11-year-old Harry Burkett. Something else which struck young Harry as odd was the fact that Crawford started to sell the furniture and even sent his 16-year-old daughter back to the city to live. Crawford then took Annie's son to lodgings in Willamaloo. Shortly thereafter, Crawford's drinking got progressively worse and he started a relationship with another woman in her 50s named Elizabeth King Allison, known as Lizzie. This new relationship understandably didn't sit well with Burkett, who decided to move out and go live with his aunt, who became increasingly concerned about Annie's whereabouts. She asked young Harry where Annie was, but his aunt found the story suspicious to say the least. After discovering that his mother was missing, Crawford apparently took Harry Burkett to The Gap, a notorious suicide spot where he threw stones from the cliffs and even tried to lure the young boy over the fence towards the cliff's edge. Young Harry also mentioned to his aunt about a week after this incident, Crawford took him to Scrubland near to Manning Road in Double Bay, where he asked Burkett to dig a hole before returning back to his lodgings. As a result of Harry recounting these suspicious events to his aunt, she reported his mother, Annie Burkett, as a missing person to the police. 
Authorities managed to track down the lodgings in Willamaloo where Crawford had been staying, but unfortunately they found it vacant. A few weeks later, on the 22nd of October, at approximately 10.30am, the charred remains of Annie Burkett were found in Bushland off Mulberry Road, behind the Cumberland Paperboard Mill, situated on Lane Cove River in Chatswood, although she wasn't actually identified until 1920 due to the severe burns to her body, making it almost impossible to identify her. She was identified through dental records, alongside jewellery and clothing that had been found at the scene, which Annie's sister, Lily, confirmed to have belonged to her sister. Also of note, a broken whiskey flagon was found near to Annie's body, as was a small bottle of kerosene and pieces of a Japanese wicker suitcase. There seemed to be no obvious signs of violence on the victim's body, and the medical examiner concluded during the autopsy that the woman most likely died from the burns, as her skin was severely blistered. However, they couldn't conclude whether the female was alive or dead whilst she was on fire. X-rays also revealed the woman to have several fractures to her skull and a large linear crack was found on the back of her skull, which could have resulted from falling onto a rock, as Harry had claimed, or from violence of some description. Annie's remains were buried in Rookwood Cemetery, at this point as an unidentified person. Annie's remains were exhumed for a second autopsy in 1920 to carry out further investigations. However, nothing of significance came of this. Annie's body was released back to her family after her subsequent identification, and she was buried in Warrenora in the south of Sydney. Harry Crawford remained a fugitive for three years before authorities found his 1919 marriage record to Lizzie King Allison in Canterbury and managed to trace him at an address in Stanmore a few months later. Harry Crawford was then arrested in July of 1920 on suspicion of murdering his wife and was subsequently sent to jail where his deepest darkest secret was revealed, a secret which Crawford requested not to be revealed to his wife. Harry Leo Crawford was not who he appeared to be to the outside world, and in a shocking twist, it came to light that he was, in fact, biologically, a female. Harry Crawford had lived his life under a number of different aliases, As a result of this confession, he was transferred to the female wing of the prison, thrown into women's clothes for the first time in over 21 years. Given the birth name of Eugenia Fellini, Harry Crawford was born on the 25th of July 1875 in either Florence or Livorno, Italy, and was the eldest of 22 children. In around 1877, when he was about two years of age, Harry and his family moved to Wellington, New Zealand. Their father was a strict and abusive man who worked numerous occupations, including as a fisherman and a carrier with a horse and cart. During Harry's childhood and teenage years, he dressed in men's clothing in a bid to obtain work in stables and brickyards, something which his parents strongly disapproved of. They were very traditional, so found it difficult to understand why Eugenia was cross-dressing. To teach Harry a lesson, his father forced him to marry a man named Martello, but Harry didn't want this. As a result, he ran away and embraced his true self as Eugene Fellini. At 16 years old, he found employment as a cabin boy on a boat, crossing the sea to Australia. It was during this time that Eugene became known as such. After Eugene left New Zealand, his family disowned him because of his, quote, controversial and shameful behaviour. They never contacted him again. 
Eugene worked as a cabin boy for a few years and on one night in 1898, after drinking heavily, he accidentally revealed to the captain of the vessel that he was born a female, telling the captain that his grandmother used to call him Piccolina, meaning little girl in Italian. After this revelation made its way across the ship, Eugene was shunned by the crew and, as a result of his drunken mistake, was repeatedly sexually assaulted by the captain and his crew. It was believed at the time that if a woman was on board a ship, it would bring bad luck. A short time later, when the boat reached its next port of call in Newcastle, New South Wales, Eugene was sent ashore penniless and pregnant. In 1899, Eugene gave birth to a daughter, Josephine Crawford Fellini, in Sydney, before heading to Double Bay with his newborn. He put Joseph in the care of an Italian-born woman living in Double Bay named Mrs. De Angelis, who Josephine referred to as her granny. This was when Eugene changed his identity entirely and became known as Harry Leo Crawford, a supposed sea captain who was born in Scotland. From this point on, Eugene only visited his daughter on the odd occasion, corroborating his time at sea. Eugene subsequently gained various employments in pubs, factories and meatworks in Sydney before becoming a horse and cart driver and general worker in 1912 for Dr Clark in Warringah. Four years after marrying Harry, Annie Burkett heard a number of rumours circulating regarding their husband's gender. Upon questioning her husband, Harry dismissed her and said nothing. This was probably due to the fact that being transgender at the time was illegal, so Harry most likely feared that his wife would report him to the police. The reason for their disagreement whilst on the picnic on the 28th of September of 1917 was due to the fact that Annie wanted to leave Harry because she quote-unquote couldn't stay married to a woman. The reason he burned Annie's body wasn't just because he feared he would be investigated, but also that his past would be revealed. During Crawford's sensational trial, known as the man-woman case across the media in Australia at the time, Annie's son Harry Burkett testified and stated that his mother was never in love with Crawford. Burkett stated that Crawford was quite persistent in his desires to be with Annie, and she eventually succumbed to his advances, but the couple were reportedly never happy. According to one witness, David Lowe, he had seen a delirious woman with a suitcase hanging around a scrub on the day in question, around 200 yards away from where Burkett's body was later found. It was those opposing the Crown's case that theorised that Annie had accidentally set herself on fire. However, some damning witness statements came to light when a woman named Henrietta Schlieblich, who rented a room to Crawford after Annie's death, claimed that Crawford told her that he had a row with his wife, gave her a crack on the head and she cleared. She even claimed that Crawford admitted his intention to kill young Harry Burkett on the cliffs at the Gap. Furthermore, something even more damning was the fact that another witness claimed that Crawford, who was illiterate, asked various people to keep an eye on the newspapers, specifically keeping an eye out for any mentions of a murder in the area. After police finally traced her down, Crawford's daughter, Josephine, who wore a black veil as she gave evidence, told the court that she had always known that her father was in fact her mother, since she was around seven years old. Crawford even told Josephine to refer to him as her father, not her mother, and told her about his name change to Harry Crawford. He told his daughter never to tell anyone his secret. According to Josephine, her granny, the woman who raised her, Mrs. De Angelis, Crawford had tried to smother her as a baby. 
It was when Mrs. De Angelis passed away when Josephine was 12 that she went back to live with her father. Crawford appeared on the stand dressed in men's attire for his preliminary hearing in July, but then dressed as a woman for his trial, which began in October of 1920. This took the Australian media by storm, as they'd never seen anything like this before. What also stunned the media was a piece of evidence presented to the court, a wooden and rubber phallus which was found in the accused's home. This showed the court how, quote, deceitful 45-year-old Harry Crawford had really been regarding his gender identity, his lovers being unaware that he didn't actually have male genitalia. Due to his repeated deception regarding his gender identity and the fact that he concealed the truth about it, the media made Crawford out to be a, quote, monster and pervert. At the end of the two-day trial, Harry Crawford pled not guilty to murdering Annie Burkett, but after deliberating for only two hours, the jury found him guilty of murder, and as a result, he was condemned to death. Crawford denied all the charges and lodged an appeal later that month on the basis that all evidence against him was purely circumstantial. He was simply the last person to see Annie Burkett alive and this in itself seemed to be enough for the jury to find him guilty of her murder. Crawford's appeal was dismissed and the guilty verdict remained. However, his sentence was lessened to life imprisonment. In February of 1931, Crawford was actually released from prison by the Minister of Justice, who cited the reasons for the convict's release was because he was, quote, 60 years old and not of robust health. Harry was then driven to an undisclosed location. The media once again were thrown into a frenzy regarding this case. There was no rock-hard evidence to confirm that Harry had actually killed Annie Burkett, and some even doubted that the body found even belonged to her. It is a case which still has many unanswered questions, and was very much one of the earliest recorded criminal cases involving a transgender person, arguably quite possibly someone who may have experienced some degree of gender dysphoria. Eugene Fellini, who was also known as Harry Leo Crawford, Lena Fellini, Nina Fellini, Eugene Martello and Jack Crawford, lived out the rest of their life as a Mrs. Jean Ford. They were never allowed to dress in men's clothing ever again. They became the proprietor of a boarding house located in Paddington in Sydney. However, on the 9th of June 1938, they were accidentally struck by a car on Oxford Street, succumbing to their injuries in Sydney Hospital the following day. Found in their possession was a handbag which contained approximately £100, which Jean got from selling the boarding house shortly prior to death. They were identified through fingerprints. Eugene Fellini was buried under their final name of Jean Ford in Rookwood Cemetery in Sydney.